Good morning and welcome to worship at Abbey and Baptist Church. Our folks have already started gathering here in the sanctuary and we want to welcome you who are joining us online via live stream. You might be watching us on Vimeo or YouTube or Facebook. If you're watching us on Facebook, be sure to comment in the comment side to let us know you're here. Let us know where you're watching and uh, if you have prayer requests, be sure to include those. Uh, just tell us to pray for and give us the name you want us to include in our morning prayer and we'll be happy to do that. Uh, someone's monitoring that and going to get those prayer requests to our pastor and he'll be voicing that prayer about five or ten minutes after the hour. So as you think about it and you have those prayer concerns, go ahead and put them in Facebook and let us know about them. We're glad you're here. We'll hope also in Facebook and other medias that you'll share that stream and let other folks know you're watching. Some of your friends on your friends list may want to watch the service with you. Then that'd give you something else to talk about this week and discuss on Facebook and those other mediums. Once again, we're delighted you're with us today and hope you have a meaningful and engaging worship experience. Remember to sing along on the hymns. Uh, us folks who are gathering here live are counting on you doing that because we're not singing here in person. All the music was recorded previously with the choir on Wednesday night, so you help us and sing along at home. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now to worship God.
Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Good morning. Let's sing together our gathering song, Morning Has Broken. We are standing on holy ground. All those who have gone before us have witnessed to the love of God. We are challenged to be people of loving service. Lord, open our hearts and spirits to accept the call to serve you by helping others. Let us pray. Lord of summer sunshine and autumn harvest, be with us this day as we gather to encounter your word and your way for us. Remind us that we can place our trust in your eternal love. Enable us to be more effective in our witness to that love by word and by deed. Guide our steps, pick us up when we falter, dust us off, and place us on the pathways of grace and service. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing How Great Our God's Majestic Name.
Good morning. Good to see you all here in the sanctuary and those of you that are joining us on live streaming. We're glad that you have tuned in and are with us in spirit, if not in presence. And we want to welcome those who are watching especially to connect with us. You can uh, send the word live, L-I-V-E, to 276-212-1288. Just text that, L-I-V-E, to 276-212-1288, and you can be in touch with us. That also works for you here in the congregation. If you're not connected with us, I think maybe we're all home folk present here this morning. I don't know. Y'all have masks on. I can't, I can't tell, but I think you are. But anyway, uh, we're here if you need us in the church office Monday through Friday. Give us a call on the church phone. Email us at office at abingdonbaptist.org, and we can be in touch with you that way. Keep us informed of your prayer needs and other needs of life and issues that we can help with. We're always glad to hear from you, and we welcome you to this time of worship this morning. As we continue in our worship, we're going to hear from our children's ministry Assistant, Ms. Carrie Trivett. Good morning, kids. Our scripture today comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Shoes come in all types and sizes. There are dress shoes that, like we might wear to church. There are athletic shoes like we wear when we play sports. There are sandals or flip-flops for summer. Let me see your shoes. I have on a pair of wedges today. We have all kinds of shoes. But why are we talking about shoes, you might be wondering. Well, shoes protect our feet, but they can also serve another purpose. Raise your hand if you wear shoes inside your house most of the time. Raise your hand if you take off your shoes when you're inside. People might take off their shoes to keep from tracking dirt inside. And in some places, people always take off their shoes and leave them at the door when they enter a house as a sign of respect. Respect means to show someone you think that person is important. And that reminds me of today's Bible lesson. God told a man named Moses to take off his shoes. To get ready to hear about what happened to Moses, let's take off our shoes now. I think it'll help us understand why God told Moses to take off his shoes. I'm going to do that, and if you wish to, you can join me. God called Moses from a burning bush to get his attention and talk to him. God had an important job for Moses. He told Moses to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. Let's hear what happened. Exodus chapter 3, verses 3 through 6 says, So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. At first, Moses was confused and wasn't sure God could really be speaking to him. God wanted Moses to lead his people, but Moses wasn't sure he was the right guy for the job. But God wanted to get Moses to pay attention. God gave Moses important instructions, just like God spoke to Moses. God speaks to us, too. Let's pray. Thank you for speaking to Moses and for speaking to us. Help us to remember to listen to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget to check out the ABC Kids page for activities to go along with today's children's message. Bye, guys. As we come to our time of pastoral prayer this morning, there are several needs that we want to be aware of. Uh, Rena Cook had successful heart bypass surgery this week at uh, Bristol Regional Medical Center, and I spoke with her on Friday. She was transferred 
uh, to Abingdon Rehab, was waiting uh, for Alan to drive her there on Friday and uh, will be undergoing a time of rehabilitation there for the next couple of weeks. Also, our Charles Grogan this week uh, had a successful kidney uh, stent replacement done, outpatient, and uh, got to drive home with Leona Willis, who was briefly in hospital um, through the ER there at Bristol Regional uh, for an infection, but she is doing better. Jeff was down to care for her and uh, reports are she's doing better. We also want to continue to pray for Ron Hicks, who's having severe back pains and went for an MRI this week on possible further treatment, and certainly Jane Hilt as she awaits news on the beginning of her radiation and chemo follow-up after surgery. And then certainly the family of Tony Hughes in his sudden passing this week. Uh, we want to pray for Janice and Mary Lynn for all the family in this time. Tony's service will be a graveside only at uh, Noel Craig Cemetery, 2 o'clock this Thursday. 2 o'clock Thursday, Noel Craig. So be in prayer for, for Tony's family, especially for Janice in this time of his sudden passing. Let's join our hearts as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do bow before you this morning. You are the King of creation, the Lord of the universe. And yet, in your sovereignty uh, and your majesty over all creation, you are imminent and you are present with us in our times of life, of good times of life, and also in the hard times of life. And so, Father, as we come before you, we know that you love us, that you've created us for a reason and a purpose, that you give us life, not only physical life that we know in the here and now, but eternal life that is ours through Christ Jesus. And so in this hour, we lift before you needs of those whom you know and needs that you know, but yet we respond to the implication of your word to Make those needs known before your throne of grace. And so we do come in intercession this morning, Lord, for those who are ill, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are seeking treatments after surgery. Lord, for those who are still in consultation with doctors about physical needs, we ask that your grace and strength would be sufficient to each need. And Lord, we also come before you for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, for Janice and Mary Lynn, for all the family in Tony's passing this week, we ask God that your grace as your word promises would truly be sufficient to their need in this hour and that your comfort and peace would even surpass our ability to comprehend it or express it in words, Lord. We know that you are present with us and that you care for us. And so, Father, we each come to you in this time with our own needs. There are many things on our prayer lists, both public, those in our classes, and other lists that we keep, Lord, even in the recesses of our hearts, we make those known to you today as your Spirit searches our hearts and intercedes before your throne of grace in our behalf, even when we don't know how to pray. Lord, we know that your Spirit intercedes and that your grace is sufficient and applied to those needs. So help us to receive your answer, maybe not always in the way and the time that we might expect or want but yet always in the perfect way in time as we look to you who is always looking for our best and our good. And so we thank you for hearing our needs and for sending your grace and love, your compassion and mercy in answer to each request that we lift now in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week in our services, we come to that time when we offer our gifts, our time, our talent, our resources to give to God. Those who are worshiping here as we gather to worship will uh, place their gifts in the offering plates that are placed at each exit. And then you that are home can give online. There are many ways to do that. You can go to our church website, abingdonbaptist.org, and click on the giving link there. You can also give in our Realm app that's called Connect. Our members have that and have the option to give through that application as well on their, on their smartphones. Others, you can also text us. Uh, the key word is give to ABC. Uh, place in the amount you wish to give and send that to this uh, phone number 73256. That's give to ABC to 73256. You may also mail your gift to our address here at the church, 361 West Main Street. 
And if you need assistance with any of those matters, please don't hesitate to call Trina in the church office at 276-628-8126. Thank you for your offerings and your gifts. They're being used here in Abingdon and around the world to build God's kingdom, and we appreciate them. Let's sing together our offertory hymn now, God Has Given Us Creation. pray. Merciful and forgiving God, the tithes and gifts we offer to you this morning are but a small portion of the blessings that we have received. The Gospels remind us that Jesus instructed us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow. And yet, we deny ourselves little. See the smallest of crosses as too great a burden and we follow only from a safe distance. In doing so, we cut ourselves off from deeper experiences of discipleship. Forgive us, O oh God, and renew our strength and discipline to walk this road with our Savior. In his holy name we pray, amen.
Amen. This coming Wednesday marks one month since SpaceX splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico on its maiden voyage, and it brought two astronauts, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, back safely to Earth. Amidst all the gloom, doom, and negativity of 2020 so far, I found this to be a bright spot and a, a sense of refreshment. The Washington Post reported the landing this way. It was the first time in the 59-year history of crewed American space travel that astronauts had used the Gulf as a landing site, adding to other firsts that marked a new chapter in NASA's human spaceflight program, the first launch of American astronauts to orbit from U.S. soil since the space shuttle was retired in 2011 and the first launch into orbit of humans on vehicles owned and operated by a private company. That was reported in the Washington Post by Jacob Bogage and Christian Davenport. And as I read that account, I was struck at several points personally. The 59-year history of manned spaceflight. I turned 60 in May. I've been alive for every major manned spaceflight milestone and aware of most of them. A few of those first ones I... I probably didn't know from my cradle, but I was alive. And the last shuttle flight, hard to believe, nine years ago, 2011. And I had the privilege of working on the shuttle for 12 years at NASA. And uh, one of the most exciting, or really two of the most exciting missions that I helped work on related to the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990, we took Hubble up, but there was trouble with Hubble. There was a slight imperfection, the mi a millionth of the thickness of a human hair. The mirror had been improperly ground that small, and Hubble had fuzzy vision. And so we prepared a set of contact lenses, <laughs> if you will, for Hubble to give it better eyesight, and in 1993, astronauts installed them on Hubble, and all of a sudden, the pictures that had been fuzzy got clear. And the things that Hubble has revealed, oh my, the majesty, the depth, and the beauty of God's creation is really beyond our imagination. The space program has allowed us to see and experience God's creation in ways that we never could from here on the earth. Now, if I were to say to you today, based on observation of the earth, that uh, the earth is round and that the earth orbits the sun, I probably would have at least 99% of you on board with those two statements. Now, there are a few folks out there, and maybe some are watching, I don't know, that are flatlanders or flat earthers, they call themselves. They still believe the earth is flat. And there might even still be a few people out there who think that the sun orbits the earth, not the earth orbiting the sun. You know, that was the common view, at least until the 1600s. After Copernicus in the late 1500s and Galileo in the early 1600s declared, no, there, the sun is at the center of our solar system and the earth revolves around it. Oh my, what heresy. In fact, Galileo was brought before a panel of the Roman Catholic Church's Inquisition. And he was condemned by the Council of Trent. And in fact, just over 400 years ago in 1616, uh, the Inquisition ordered Galileo, listen to this, to abstain completely from teaching or defending this doctrine and opinion or from discussing it, to abandon completely the opinion that the sun stands still at the center of the world and the earth moves, and henceforth not to hold, teach, or defend it in any way whatsoever, either orally or in writing. 
So not only did they disagree with the teaching, but they told him to keep quiet. Well, I wish I could have met Galileo for a lot of reasons, but he had a lot of vinegar, and he didn't shut up. In fact, he wrote more and he taught more. And, uh, and when the Inquisition had him on his knees to confess his heresy as he arose, he says, but it still moves. <laughs> even though, even though. In fact, he spent the last nine years of his life in uh, home confinement, if you will, because they wanted to keep him under lock and key. Now, Galileo's clear evidence for a sun-centered solar system was viewed in his day as heresy because of the interpretation of Scripture. Listen, here are the Scriptures that those who called him a heretic pointed out. Psalm 19. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And Ecclesiastes 1.5, the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. And Psalm 104.5, God set the earth on its foundations. It cannot be moved. Now, we hear those verses and we think about a sun-centered solar system and we don't really see the problem, do we? Because the ancients who were here on the surface of the earth were simply observing phenomenon. And scripture spoke to the human experience. It seems as if the sun does rise. Boy, I get some beautiful sunrises out at my house there on Azure Lane. I share some of them with you on Facebook. I know you like those. It's beautiful to see that sun come up and target its course across the sky and set each night beautifully in the west. But we know that it's really the earth that is revolving around the sun now, not the sun that is revolving around the earth. And when God speaks about the earth being set on foundations, it cannot be moved. He's speaking about the power of his creation, that he has created the earth and founded it for a purpose. He's not literally saying that it is fixed in space and does not move. So we can see the proper interpretation, but in Galileo's day, theologians did not see that. So there are some lessons, I think, that we can learn from this dispute between Galileo and the church and that we can apply as we speak the truth in love about creation today. While scripture is inerrant, friends, hear me clearly, scripture is inerrant, sometimes our interpretation of scripture is erroneous. We can make mistakes. God's word is inerrant. It communicates truth. Our problem as human beings sometimes is understanding the truth that lies in God's word. God's word is inerrant, but sometimes our interpretation of God's word can be erroneous. We can make mistakes. We're only human. Science and theology, friends, should not be enemies, but they should be collaborators. They should work together to unlock the mysteries of creation. I truly believe that because I am both a scientist in my training and experience at NASA, and I am a theologian in my experience and training as a pastor and a professor. And I believe that science and theology can work together to unlock and interpret properly God's word. Paul observed, importantly, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So God gives a natural revelation to us in the majesty and the beauty of his creation. And we certainly live in a beautiful part of the world to see it, don't we? The mountains and the lakes and the rivers and the birds and all point us to the powerful creator to God. And that's what Paul was saying in Romans 1. But John also declares in the first chapter of his gospel, 
John 1, 14, that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God's revelation is not limited to just creation, but God reveals Himself to us in the Word, both the written Word of the Bible and, more importantly, in the living Word of the indwelling presence of Christ Jesus, His Son. So we have these twin revelations from God. His creation, which is the realm of science, and His Word, both the written and living Word, Jesus, which is the realm of theology. Tremper Longman III is a, a fellow Old Testament professor. He's a little more famous than I am. So I was talking with someone today, or this week, and they said, well, he's probably a rock star in your business. And I said, yeah, he's a rock star. I got to meet him and spend a little time with him a year ago when I went out to a lecture series at B.H. Carroll Theological Institute where I teach. And, and while I was there, I picked up a copy of, of one of his books, Confronting Old Testament Controversies. Wonderful, wonderful book. And in that book, Tremper addresses this issue of the division and the unfortunate conflict between science and theology. And I want to share with you what he says here. I love, love this little excerpt. God reveals himself in scripture and through nature. Both are books that involve interpretation. Since God is the ultimate author of both scripture and nature, both are true, though our interpretations of either may not be. To be open to a different interpretation than the one we hold is not to betray Scripture, but to honor it. The same, of course, is true of our interpretation of nature. When we interpret the Bible correctly, it will never conflict with science if science is correctly interpreting nature. See, both sources of revelation come from the same person, God. Nature and the Word both come from God, and they reveal truth. And when we properly interpret the truth, we will find harmony, not discord. Today's world, conflict often arises between the scientific interpretation of nature, which we often phrase as evolutionism, the theory of evolution and the belief of an evolutionary system, and a theological interpretation known as creationism. And there are many forms of creationism, but uh, the, perhaps the strongest is the belief in a literal seven days of creation based on Genesis chapter 1. And many times evolutionism and creationism stand in conflict in our world. Now we're in a series that I've entitled Speaking the Truth in Love based on Paul's command there in Ephesians 4 that we should speak the truth in love to one another. And I believe that we must speak the truth in love on a variety of controversial and sometimes divisive issues. Divisive not only between the church and the world, but folks, this issue of creation is sometimes divisive within the body of Christ. Strong opinions are held on many different possible views of how and when God created, and it can cause division among us. So I think we must speak the truth in love to ourselves and to the world on these issues. And we must speak that truth with a winsome love that is empathetic. We feel with the other seeker that is humble, that says, I may not know it all, and in fact, I may sometimes make a mistake in my interpretation with a love that is self-sacrificial like the love of Jesus to give grace to the other person and another opinion even if we don't agree with it and that certainly seeks to see the image of God in the other person that they are not less than I or you that they are equal at the foot of the cross and created in the image and likeness of God which is is in our central text today here in, in Genesis 1 26 to 31. We must speak the truth in love. And so over the next five weeks, counting today, 
we're going to camp out in the first three chapters of Genesis. I'm really going to hit a few verses in Genesis 1 this week, and then in future weeks we'll move on to Genesis 2 and 3. But we're going to look today at this issue of creation and the truth of creation. We're going to look next week at the environment. That's a divisive issue today. What shall we do about the environment? We're going to look at the issue of the sanctity of life. We're going to look at the issue of human sexuality. And we're going to look at the issue of, of sin and suffering and, and hell. So these are all important issues, aren't they, in today's world and sometimes very divisive in how we answer them within the body of Christ and even as we answer them to the world. But we're seeking a path through the truth that's revealed in God's Word that we might share that truth with a winsome love to those who are seeking the truth. Now I often refer to Genesis 1 through 3 and Revelation 19 through 21 as the divine bookends of the Bible because they speak about the eternities, the time before eternity or the eternity before eternity <laughs> and the time after time or the continuation of eternity, right? Genesis 1 through 3 is the beginning and, Genesis, and Revelation 19 to 21 is the end. And in between the great divine bookends that are filled with much mystery lies the ultimate revelation of God's truth at the center, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who holds the great bookends together, the beginning and the end, or as he calls himself in the Revelation, the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega, the end. And so today, we're taking a peek into that first great bookend, which is the beginning. And we're seeking the truth of what God reveals to us in His Word about the beginning. When we approach Scripture, friends, we must interpret it with care. Remember I told you that the Word of God is inerrant. But sometimes our interpretation of the Word of God can be erroneous. We can make mistakes when we interpret it, when we approach God's Word, one of the first things we must address is what kind of literature is this? You know, the Bible is filled with many different types of writings. There is poetry, of course. We know and love the Psalms and we sing the Psalms, right? And there is biography. We have biographical passages in Samuel about David how David grew up and fought Goliath and we learn about Jeremiah from Baruch in the closing chapters of Jeremiah and, and there is gospel, certainly we have four of them, right, that give us a revelation of Jesus and who he is and there is history, certainly, the, the rise of the Israelites and Exodus and uh, the the uh, time of captivity in Babylon, we, we find many historical passages and I believe, friends, that these first chapters of Genesis can be classified as history, but I would submit to you that they are a special type of history, which I call, and others call, a theological history. That the history that is presented here in the opening chapters of Genesis is not like a history book that we might pull down off the shelf of our library today to go back and look up Facts and figures, oh yes, the revolution began in 1776 and the Continental Congress met in 1781 to form the Constitution. And we can go back and fact check and look at the dates and exactly what happened in a historical chronology. That's the purpose of, of a true history. But Genesis as a theological history has its focus on telling us about God and about who He is and who we are as a part of all that he has done, that, that he is the one who was there in the beginning and that he has created us with a purpose to find life in him. So it is a theological history. And we also must interpret Scripture, friends, knowing that, that while the Word of God applies to us, it was not written originally to us. 
Now hear me carefully on that. The Word of God comes to us and applies to us, but the words that we read in Genesis were not written originally to us in this century. They were written to Israelites. Israelites who stood on an earth and saw the sun rise in the east and set in the west. Who did not have a scientific mind like we do in the modern west to know, well, how did that happen? and When did that happen? And we want to know and classify and dichotomize and trichotomize everything in detail. Yeah, that's our scientific nature, but the ancient Hebrews simply wanted to know who is this God? And who am I in relationship with Him? And is there a purpose for my life or am I just here because I'm here? They wanted to know who and why. The other thing that I would say to you, friends, is that when we bring the wrong questions to the Bible, we don't always get satisfactory answers or we get conflicting answers. When we try to read the theological history of Genesis and answer the scientific questions of when and how, we find division and disharmony. But we come to the theological history of Genesis and we read it to understand who created and who we are in creation and why we're here. What is our purpose? Then we can find, I think, very satisfying answers because those are the questions that God answers. The who and the why, not the when and the how. God wants us to know that He is the Creator and that He has created each one of us and that He has a purpose and a plan for our lives. Now, I could spend a month unpacking Genesis 1 and 2 in detail. In fact, I once took a class many years ago in seminary on Genesis 1 through 11. We spent a whole semester to cover those 11 chapters. And let me just say, we barely got through chapter 3, and in the last lecture of the 16-week term, the professor hurriedly covered the rest of it because <laughs> we drilled down and, and got so detailed in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And they are critical chapters to understand who God is, who we are, what sin is, why we need God, what God's plan is and purpose. for It's all right there in the beginning. And so I could spend quite a long time going through it, and maybe I will sometime. But let me just tell you the essence of the message. God is the creator of everything and everyone, including you and me. And he has created us for a special purpose, which is relationship with him. Let me just read the text. It's always good to read the text, and I'm finally getting to it after all that introductory work. We have to set the stage, right, so that we can properly interpret the text. And I'm going to read just a portion of chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 5, and then I'm going to skip down to about verse 26. We'll cover the first day of the creative week and the last day. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now down to verse 26, the last day of God's creative activity, the sixth day. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, 
so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Bereshith, bara, Elohim, Hashemim wahata ha'eretz. The beautiful language of the Hebrews. The opening powerful words. Three words it takes us in English. In the beginning. Bereshith. Bereshith in Hebrew points to the start, but it is not an indication of when the start began. Simply put, God was there when it all started. When did it start? In the beginning. That's the beginning of the story. That's the, great, the beginning of the great left divine book in the beginning. In the beginning, Elohim, God. There are many different names for God in Hebrew. This is the powerful name of God, the mighty and strong one. And certainly we would want a creator who is mighty and strong. To create all that exists, including us, would take great power. And the Hebrews attribute God as the one with that power. That Elohim bara, bara, the Hebrew verb for creation, is a verb that is used only of God throughout Scripture. Now man can as share, God, God creates, but man as share, he forms, he fashions, he takes what God has created and forms and shapes it maybe into something else like a pot on the wheel or a wood into a structure. Or, but God, only God creates. And so it is the powerful God who creates and then what is it that God creates in the Hebrew? He creates a taha shemim wahataha eretz. He creates the heavens above and the earth below. Meaning what? Everything. Everything that I can see above and everything that I see around me and below me, all this comes from God, the powerful one. The only one who can bring it into being. The one who has created everything that is at the beginning, whenever that was. It was God who did it. God is the creator. Right there in verse 1. I don't think we can see it any more clearly. God is the one who has created everything and everyone that has existed, is existing now, us, and will yet exist in the future. God is at the center of everything, and he has been here since the beginning. Really, even before the beginning, God is eternal. That's, that's a hard concept for our human minds to conceive, that even before our beginning, the beginning of creation, there was God. And certainly, after he returns in the new heaven and the new earth, God will continue in eternity, and we who have faith in him will have life eternal as well. So God is the creator. Another great insight from this passage is that God brings order and purpose to his creation. There, verse 2, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You know, the earth is our normal human vantage point, isn't it? And that would have been the normal human vantage point for the Hebrews to whom this story was initially written. 
Unfortunately, they didn't have SpaceX, and I don't know if you'll ever get to go up in SpaceX or any of the space planes that they're working on. Maybe we will get to see the Earth from space someday, but our normal place of observation is the Earth, and so that's where the story begins, observing what was going on on the Earth, and the Hebrew says that the Earth was tohu wa bohu. It was formless and void. It had no shape, and there was nothing in it. And, and this phrase, tohu wahabohu, appears only two more times in the whole of Hebrew Scripture. It appears in the prophets as a word of God's judgment, speaking about the desolation and the judgment of God that comes on those who are disobedient, that they are made tohu wahabohu, that they become formless and void that they face destruction, a decreation, if you will. And so God speaks. He speaks, and God said, look at it there, verses 3, 6, 9, 14, 20, 24, and 26, and God said, Elohim speaks, and it is by His powerful Word that things come into order, that creation is ordered and filled simply by His Word. <laughs> Much more powerful than simply to speak it. And so it is. After speaking light into existence, we read it there in verse 3. God evaluates His work and He says on days 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, that what He has created, what He has spoken into being by His powerful Word is good. Hebrew word tov. And it means that what God has created fulfills the purpose for which it was intended. Isn't that beautiful? That there was a purpose. There's, that's the meaning behind this word good. It's not just... An, you know, an attribution of the attributes. Oh, yes, it looks nice, it's pretty, and, you know, light is twinkly. And No, it's that God had a purpose in speaking it into existence, and it fulfills that purpose, which brings joy to the Creator's heart. And if you noticed when I read that last verse, 31, after the creation of human beings, God adds, it was very good. Very good. Human beings as the apex of God's creation. And, and I've got so much to unpack there, we've got to wait for the next few weeks. The, <laughs> the environment, our role in the environment and the sanctity of life and sexuality and all these things pivot off that verse of verses related to the creation of human beings in the image and the likeness of God. But, but let me just say that on that first day and on the subsequent five days, the six, first six days of creation, we know that God rested on the seventh or the Sabbath day. But in the active days of creation, those first six days, notice how God forms and fills. Remember, in verse 2, the earth was what? Formless and void or empty. And so God takes that beginning and He forms it and he fills it. Look at how the days go together. Day one, what happens? God creates light and dark. And then on day four, he places the sun and the moon. So he gives form, light and dark are form, and then he fills the form with sun and moon. And on day two, what does God create? The sea and the sky. The sea and the sky. And on day five, what does he do? He places creatures in the sky and in the sea. He forms the sea and sky. Then he fills the sea and sky. And then on day three, the earth. He forms, he shapes, he prepares the fertile earth. And then on day six... He adds the animals, the apex of which would be us as human beings. So he forms the earth. He prepares the earth. 
and then he fills it with creatures, including human beings. So God is the creator, and God brings order and purpose to his creation. These are the things that we can see clearly. I think we can agree on theologically in Genesis 1. And the last thing I would say about these verses is the ultimate focus of God's creative activity is us. We like that, don't we? As human beings, we like to be the center of attention. Well, we're the center of God's creative attention. Day six. Now, all the other parts of creation are certainly important, but God's creation of humanity is very important. It was very good because God had a special purpose for humanity. He forms us, friends, in his image and likeness. An image like his own. And I love, again, I got to share a phrase from my friend Tremper Longman. That the image of God is not a quality or an attribute of human beings, but rather a status that comes with responsibility. The image of God in us is not a quality or an attribute. It's not that we have arms and legs and think and use language, although those could be parts of the image of God. The ultimate expression of the image of God is the fact that he is in us and has given us a special place in his creation. But that special place in creation is not just so we feel good about ourselves, but it comes with responsibility. More on this as we talk about the environment and life and marriage and other issues in weeks ahead. But God's assessment is that we are very good. God is the creator. His nature is one of powerful creativity. He has an intimate, a relational knowledge of every part of his creation. There's nothing in all that God has created that he does not know and understand. And he's personally involved. He's not the divine watchmaker that winds it all up and casts it away. Okay, you go do your thing. No, God is involved, as we see in this text, with his creation. He gives his creation form and fullness. He gives us purpose, and there is meaning in creation. God has a plan for everything and everyone whom he creates. He wants us to know who he is, who we are and why we exist. Now those, friends, are questions that everyone that's ever lived, I believe, has contemplated at one time or another. Who am I? Who is God? Is there a God? And if so, who is He? And what is my relationship with Him and my purpose as a part of His creation? Unfortunately, our, our modern scientific minds are drawn to questions about when God created and how he created. And these, these questions, again, did not concern the original hearers and I don't think really should concern us based in the verses here in Genesis because God's speaking about himself as creator and us as his creation and our purpose together. But certainly if we acknowledge that God is all-powerful, then we must acknowledge that he can create using any method that he sovereignly chooses. Can God create by calling into existence everything that is in seven literal days of creation? Yes, he could. Yes, he could. That's creationism, young earth creationism. There's also a version of creationism known as old earth creationism that the days in Genesis don't represent literal 24-hour days, but long geologic periods, and that God created through the geological ages. That's the old earth creationist viewpoint. Certainly, there is the possibility, and again, remember, keeping our minds open to possibilities is honoring of God's word that God could create using evolution. Theistic. Hear that? Not just evolution. Theistic evolution. That God used the method of evolution to create in this world. 
which is the right answer? I don't know. I can't tell you because that's not what the text is talking about. It's not talking about the when and the how. The text is talking about the who and the why. When we bring proper questions to the word, we get satisfactory answers. Let me say this. Friends, the tent is wide when it comes to our beliefs about creation. Just as the tent is wide about the other bookend that we'll talk about someday in Revelation about what's going to happen at the end times and how and when is all that going to take place. See, we bring the same questions there that we bring here. But I can tell you that God has created you and me. He has created all that is. That he has created us for a purpose which is relationship with himself. And that relationship is best revealed in his living word that he sent to us in Jesus Christ. And that as we come to relationship with him in Christ Jesus, we can find his ultimate purpose for us. And that faith, friends, is always required. No, what, no matter what you might believe or no matter how you might interpret the when and the how that God did it all, faith is always required. That's where I end on this discussion. No matter where you are in the tent of Christian, possible Christian beliefs about creation, faith is always required. That's what the writer of Hebrews said. Without faith, what? It is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6. He's talking about faith. If we have faith in God, then some of the details don't matter. The when and the how are not as important when we know who and why. And that's what we must focus on. You know, as humans, we all need new beginnings, clean slates, do-overs, fresh starts. A good friend gave us uh, a little memento that we're hanging up in our guest room at our new home that talks about the fact that in this household, grace is shown, uh, forgiveness is granted and received, do-overs are allowed. It's a beautiful little saying on a wall hanging. And you know what? Even the Roman Catholic Church needs a do-over once in a while. Back in 1992, Pope John Paul II convened uh, the Papal uh, Academy of Sciences and he officially declared that Galileo was right about the sun being at the center of our solar system. 350 years later, they said, you know, we think we made a mistake there. Remember what? God's word is inerrant. But sometimes our interpretation of God's word is erroneous. We must share the truth humbly, empathetically self-sacrificially and always seeking to acknowledge the image of God in others. Without Jesus, we can't fully know God. We can't enjoy his creation. We can't fulfill the purpose for which we've been created. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And theologian Bill Hendricks says, The God of creation is the God of new beginnings. His bringing to be and letting be are accompanied by the mysteries of his calling into being, the new and the not yet. Isn't that beautiful? God is still at work in his creative process. It didn't stop in the beginning. But God has been working on us, on humanity, on you and me, and he continues to work on us in Christ Jesus to recreate, reform us into the image of His Son, to His glory. God grants us purpose, presence, and grace. And He invites us, each one of us, into a relationship with Him. Today we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you've never truly encountered the God of creation, if you've never understood who He is and who He has created you to be, perhaps today is the first time to say yes to His Word, His living Word, Christ Jesus, and to ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to help you find and fulfill your God-given purpose as you live in the beauty and majesty of His creation. 
We're going to sing, and this is a time to make that decision, a time to recommit, perhaps a time to even think about healing some wounds where you may have been wounded or wounded others because of dogmatic expressions of your creation beliefs and that you can understand that it might be possible for someone to hold a different belief than yours and still know and love the same powerful creator and to seek his purpose in life. Maybe there's some healing and forgiveness, recommitment to be open to the proper interpretation of Scripture. I don't know what God's Spirit is speaking to your heart directly today, but you allow the Spirit to speak. And just as He hovered over the waters that were formless and void, so He hovers over your heart to bring form and to fill it with His love and His purpose. As we come to Him in Christ Jesus, we'll sing. Join in now as we sing our hymn of commitment. Come teach us, Spirit of our God. As we prepare to go, remember this Wednesday, the Bible study will come out about 4 o'clock on Facebook. Also, Carrie has activities on our ABC Kids page. I'm not sure if they'll be meeting for Kids Zoom this week or not. I can't remember. She didn't say in her video, but 6.30 normally on Wednesday nights for Kids Zoom. And then don't forget, 2 o'clock on Tuesday at Noel Craig, the graveside service for Tony Hughes, be in prayer for that family. Certainly our four Zoom Sunday School classes will meet uh, next Sunday morning at 945 and we'll be back here for in-person and live streaming worship. We're certainly glad that you have joined us and uh, now as we depart uh, let us go in the Father who creates and calls us and in the Son who is the living Word within us and in the Spirit who forms and fills us for ministry. To the glory of God, amen.